and we <coughs> began the role of the husband and we saw that uh, the husband should regard his family as a blessing he should gain joy from his family I think men often look many places to find joy and happiness but we're forced to find it in our homes now that's not the only place but it should be the major place that we find the joy we look uh, second of all to the husband or father uh, who fears God and if he fears God and we talked about what that means then he'll have great benefit part of that benefit is that he'll have children and a wife and uh, who desire to fear God too and so uh, the nature of the home and how God has set it up is that the man is uh, the head of the home and he has sets a great deal of the tenor so does the woman but uh, the man is the one who should be leading and as he leads and he is a man who fears God which is an attitude that enters forth into action then there'll be a difference in his home and we saw then if we fear God uh, we should obey him and of course fearing God and obeying God go together and then we looked at the fourth principle and that is the man's or the husband's responsibility in lovingly leading his family in the same way as Christ leads the church and last time we looked at Ephesians uh, chapter 5 and I'd like to go over that again briefly and then enter into the section where we uh, <clears throat> uh, left off last time so let's look at Ephesians chapter 5 and notice in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 that we have a, a very important principle that he begins with as I said last time if <laughs> If you haven't realized it or not, you're not able to do your role um, uh, because uh, uh, what God demands is beyond our ability. And that's what he begins with Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. It says, be filled with the Spirit. As we're controlled by the Spirit of God, we're able to obey what God tells us to do. And so I find, as I said before, that my counseling on spiritual life or I mean on the Christian home or counseling with husband and wife ultimately comes to your spiritual life because uh, I'm going to be asking you to do things that's beyond your ability it's beyond anybody's ability but it's not beyond that which God has supplied in the power of the Holy Spirit and so he begins with Ephesians 5:18 because he wants to realize uh, wants us to realize that we need to, be, need to be controlled by the Spirit. And he talks about husband and wife role, and then parent and children, and then uh, slave and master situation, and then spiritual warfare. And he said in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 21, that we are to submit one to another. And this helps us to realize the abuse that should not be there. And here we are. Uh, uh, we usually hear that the man is to be the head and the woman is to submit and that is the main roles but we are have a mutual submission we have different roles but that mutual submission keeps it from a superior inferior or a DI sergeant and a corporal here you know get in line so God understood that and so I believe he's telling us to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ and then he begins, and we saw last time a few little principles here. If you notice verse 23, the husband is the head of the wife. But notice how, as Christ is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. And so we see here, uh, all the constant comparison is Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And that way we do not have abuse in a relationship, or at least legitimately. Now, really in verse 25 we begin, and it says, Husbands, you are to love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, what kind of love is that? Well, you say to me, well, it's agape love. Well, yes, but what is agape love? What would be a characteristic? What one word could you put there to say that it is agape love? Unconditional love. Excellent. Now, you know, we think about that. Unconditional love is that I'm to love at, irregardless of what the 
the worthiness or unworthiness of the object that I am loving. <laughs> okay? And that takes a love that's beyond us, isn't it? I mean, someone loves you, you have a tendency to love them back. Of course, Scripture says if you love someone that loves you, well, you're no different than the pagans, you know? They do that. The question is, if we love someone who's not worthy of our love, who is uh, going against us, who, who hurts us, now, there's a different understanding. I mean, there's, there's some people think love is something that you do nothing to, and you can be a doormat and uh, be run over. But uh, there's actions. Of disciplining your children, spanking them is love. <laughs> so we need to understand what love is, but uh, we are to do it unconditionally. Another word could be sacrifice. And if you think about the God we love, you think about our Lord. And what did he do? He sacrificed for us. That's why I use the term for agape love, a self-sacrificing service that meets the need of another. And so you have three S's there, and sometimes we can remember those, those aspects. Now, last time we looked about leadership, and I don't want to repeat that because I don't have time, but we need to look at what it means to be sacrificial love, and I think all of us would, would agree that the love chapter of First Corinthians 13 is where we need to turn. So you turn over there. Now I know that this is nothing new to you, but I don't know about you is that every time I read it, I get convicted. <laughs> because this is not a definition of agape love. This is a description of it, which sometimes is more helpful than a definition because it's giving you specifics. And he tells you in verse 4 that love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. In other words, love ha has nothing to do with being jealous of someone. Love has nothing to do with bragging or being arrogant. That's not a loving thing. It does not act unbecomingly. That's a nice word of saying you don't, you're not rude. <laughs> does not seek its own. I think everybody falls out there. You know, I know I do. Gosh, doesn't seek my own thing. Don't seek my own. Love does not seek selfishness. Love does not, uh, see, uh, is not provoked. I mean, you don't have to provoke love. Love is given. Unconditional love is is constantly given. You don't, have to, you don't have to provoke it. I mean, you know, the tit for tat and relationships, you know, well, they did this, well, I'm going to do this because they did that. And, you know, you go back and forth and you just go, ah. Ricky and I were involved in uh, our dating relationship. I told her right straight up, I'm not interested in that. You know, this tit for tat, and you do this, and I'm going to do that because you hurt me. And I, want to do this. I said, let's just go right straight through and say, hey, you hurt me. I don't like that. And we don't have to play the games. I call it playing the games. I wasn't interested in any games. But, we, but there is a tendency to play that game. Uh, does not take into account a wrong suffered. Mm. Mm. It's not selfish. doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. I mean, can you... Uh, uh, you ever been in an argument with your mate and all of a sudden you say, well, when? Hey, man. <laughs> you go... Ooh, <laughs> you get a big old long list there, you know. <laughs> well, I don't think that's love, you know. There may be a sense of saying, I can remember, I don't remember exactly when, because you're not trying to keep count, okay. But uh, uh, it doesn't take in the wrong suffering. It doesn't hold up. It doesn't take revenge. It doesn't say, well, you know, you owe me. It's not sacrificial if it's that way does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things. Now, the, that word there really means to cover all things. You know, love covers a multitude of sins. It believes all things. It doesn't mean that you're gullible, that you believe everything, you, but you, but you want to believe what your mate says. I mean, you, you, that's, that's the, 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 on the surface. Is that what they say? Okay, I take it. Honestly, faithfully, okay? And it uh, endures all things. It does, doesn't it? I think uh, 
The love of a mother toward her child often is that way, isn't it? Just endures all kinds of things, don't you, Mom? And Dad. Well, that's the kind of love description that I'm talking about here. And is that kind of love that I think why I turn to 1 Corinthians 13 quite a bit to convict me. <laughs> that am I, as a husband, lovingly leading my family in a way it should be? It is a sacrificial thing, isn't it? Um, men, uh, that means you need to be a student of your wife. You go, what do you mean? Well, you need to know her. You say, well, I don't, I mean, uh, one of the classic things that men say is, and we're going to get to is, you know, I can't understand her, you know? I can't understand her. The problem with you ladies is you understand us. <laughs> That's the problem, right? <laughs> you understand us too well. <laughs> we're too predictable. <laughs> Well, that's one of our jobs, men, is that we need to be a student, my wife. I used to be irritated at my wife with some of her, uh, what shall we say, just her characteristics of what she liked, okay? I go, yeah. And now I just get so tickled. I get tickled at her so much. For example, last night, you know, I was looking through one of my computer magazines, and uh, all of a sudden there was this picture there, an old-timey picture, had a young boy with a little bow tie on, you know. Looked like a Norman Rockwell kind of thing, you know. And you could see the teacher was a little bit large, you know, and a little globe over here, and all the students were just dressed up old-timey, you know. And this, and on Blackboard it has, you know, frogs eat flies, you know, and this, that, and the other, and they were studying certain kind of, and here's this bow tie little boy. He was about six years old, you know, and his glasses and big old smile, and he had this big, huge frog up there, and he was showing it. <laughs> and I knew my wife would love that. Why? Because I had become a student of what she likes. She likes old timey stuff. She likes the old type of life and that kind of picture and this, that, and the other. And so as soon as she saw it, she goes, oh, look at this, you know. Why? I'm becoming a student of my wife. Am I perfect? By no means. But do you know what she likes and what she wants and what she has and what she would like to do? Become a student of your wife. Verse 26 says this, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. Now you have to realize that in this illustration, you have two illustrations. You have Christ and the church, as it's trying to tell us what Christ does to his church. And on the other hand, you have an analogy of the Christ and the church being husband as the analogy of Christ and the body being the wife. Now, it's obvious that we cannot purify our wives, men. But what would be the analogy? God, Christ, who's the head of the church, is purifying me through the, through the scriptures by the washing of the water as the dealing with the scriptures. Now, the analogy that comes over to us is that we are responsible in the area, in the area of... Uh, of her spiritual life. And in verse 26 and 27, he has two points here, huh? Excuse me, yes. What did I say? Ephesians 5. Excuse me. Well, I'm, we're back in Ephesians 5, verses 25, uh, 26 and 27. Okay? And that's sanctifying her, setting her apart by the word. Um, and then it goes on by cleansing her by washing of the word. We have a responsibility for her purity. Now, she does too. But what I'm saying is that we don't want to take her where places where it would not be pure. We don't want to direct her to places that were not pure. We don't want to watch things, put her in her sight, things that would not make her pure. We want to encourage her in the purity of her walk. And we'll be accountable for that. Now, she will too. But what did you do uh, to, in, to help in whatever it was in her purity? That would be the analogy for us. Verse 27 would deal, talks about presenting her to the Lord. It says uh, that he might present to himself a church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle 
or any such thing, that she should be holy and blameless. Again, dealing with the purity. We can't do that, man. God's going to do that to us. What is the analogy now? It seems to me that he's dealing again with purity, but also involved in her growth, that she may what uh, the church may be spot without spot and wrinkle. Therefore, there is a maturity coming, isn't there? The church will one day will be completely mature and set apart unto God and when he comes a second time, right? Well, we have responsibility with her purity and her spiritual growth, okay? She does too, but what did you do to encourage her in her spiritual walk? Did you come home and take care of the kids for 30 minutes to an hour so she could go in the back room so that she could have her time of uh, teaching in, in the Word? Because oftentimes when you get small kids, they're in time. I mean, you should, yeah, I like to have spend time in the Word, but, you know, mom's being 24 hours a day. Maybe you have to come off on the side and have that done so that she can spend time. Did you encourage her to, to read the Scriptures? Did you encourage her to go to a ladies' Bible study? Did you encourage her to be involved in certain things in the church, in the things of God? I think God's going to, as we stand before the beam and seat of Christ, he's going to ask us these things. We're going to be accountable for those kinds of things because that's our responsibility as head of the home. Now, if you did those things and she didn't do them, then that's her problem. I mean, you can't make her. You can't crack the whip. <laughs> We're not in a concentration camp, but we are responsible men to encourage that in her life. Those areas that you know, men, your wives have struggled with. They're sinful areas. They're besetting sins. We got them too. Do you encourage in that area or do you smash them with it? Do you turn the knife in it? Or do you encourage them in that way? Do you involve and come alongside them and encourage them in that way in the scripture? That's what I believe he's talking about. We in our sacrificial loving leadership we're involved in the purity and their spiritual growth. Verse 28 speaks about love again. It says, So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. Now, what do you do, man? Do you, you take care of your body, don't you? Uh, you clean it, you wash it, hopefully you exercise it, you want to take care of that thing. Well, that's the same thing that we ought to be doing with our wives. Are we taking care of them? What are we doing to take care of them? We could go into all kinds of things, but we are to be taking care of her and we are to be building up her as a person. Are you? Those areas that they struggle with, are you building them up? Those areas that they have problems in, what are you doing? That's leadership. I need to take action here. How may I encourage my wife? The areas that she struggles with. That's like loving myself. That's what the scripture says. If I love my wife, I'm like loving myself. What? With two becoming one. Verse 29. Tells a little further what do you what do you mean that we should take care of them? It says, For no one ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. And this nourishing means that he provides. Men, we are to provide for the home. Sure, we're supposed to be bringing home the bacon, as they all say, or bringing home the check so that you can take care of the family physically. But, but I don't believe he's just talking about just providing physically. I think the whole concept, emotionally. I mean, some guys come home and uh, they uh, add nothing to the family. You know, that's up to mom. No. Well, I'm to be involved in the, in the home. I'm supposed to be involved with the kids. I'm supposed to be involved in spiritual things. Mom's not always supposed to give the devotion times for the kids. I should be giving those things. Okay? And then it says nourishing, not only um, uh, nourishing, but cherishing. And I think, uh, not getting the whole up, but not only cherishing, loving, and protecting. That's why uh, wives that the guys are always saying, please lock the door when I leave, right? Or be careful going here. Or, no, you can't go to the grocery store after dark, you know? 
I had the hardest time with Victory on that coming to Houston. I mean, you know, it came from little old Kerrville. You know, it took me three years, I think, for her to consistently lock the doors. <laughs> I was, uh, I was scheming to see if I could get somebody to come over and just scare the living daylights out of her one time. <laughs> but I'm afraid she'd have a heart attack, so I didn't. Uh, she would go out. Here we are living in Houston, and she'd go out at night and, and to put up the car. And it was on the street, you know. 10:30 at night, you know, I usually do it, but she do it once in a while. She just get in the car, open the door, you know, I mean, it wasn't locked, just open the door, turn on the key, you know, back it up and push, put it in there. Big old van, you know. Somebody could be in the van. So one time I <laughs> I did, I have to confess. I uh I, she got out of the car and I went over and I said, did you see that man in the car? <laughs> <laughs> There's a man in that car. You know? <laughs> this is the last time she did it, though. She, she now looks if she ever has to do it, okay? <laughs> I've caught her numerous times walking in the parking lot. She didn't have any idea was who was around her. I mean, she, I don't know what, God just didn't, I don't know how he did it to me, but no one taught it to me. I just, whether I was in Kerrville or Podunk High or Houston, when I walk out someplace, I'm aware of who's around me, and, and I can talk and do it. I know who's backing out and who's in what car because I'm looking for it. I'm aware, and that's what I'm trying to do with the kids as well as my wife. That's why we want to protect you, ladies. That's why we don't want you walking at night. That's why my wife continually tries to fudge a little bit. It's, it's not dark yet. I gotta walk. I have to be home at dark. <laughs> because we love, it's part of our responsibility. And there's more than just protecting physically. And that's why I spent two sessions on protecting your home spiritually. If you don't know what's going on today, you're in trouble because your home will be attacked in ways you'll never know. And you'll wonder, why did my kids get off? Why are we off? Because we're not aware of the times we live in. I don't mean that <clears throat> we live in such bad times we can't witness. And that, oh, that's a great time to witness. Great time to be a Christian. But if you're not aware... It's going to be a rotten time because of what's out there today. So, verse 30 and 31, Because we are members of his body, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one. And I believe this deals with a, becoming a family unit, leaving so that we may cleave together. Why? That it may be a permanent relationship. So I think... It's dealing with becoming a family unit that is permanent. Marriage should be permanent. That's what we should be shooting for. That's the ideal. Yeah, I know there's exception, just that and the other, but I'm afraid that too many times we have uh, uh, centered on the exception instead of the, what God says that we are to do. I mean, God says don't sin. If you do, then this, that, and the other. But, but we don't want to say, well, what about this, this, this? That's the goal I want to set. That's what I want. That's what I'm saying. Permanency. And then finally in verse 33, uh, 30, uh, 32 and 33, this mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife, even as himself, and let the wife see to it that she respects her husband. So the husband needs to realize that his home is a witness to the world. If you said not one word to your neighbor about Jesus, which I hope you do, the way you conduct your relationship with your wife and children will have a tremendous influence. When I was in seminary, I didn't have a whole lot of time uh, working and going to school and having kids. <laughs> and... Uh, we wanted to make sure we did not neglect our neighbors. And so we tried to witness to our neighbors across the street, at least get to know them. We thought we had failed miserably. You know, we had them over to eat one time and try to get on spiritual things. And, man, they threw that away like a hot potato. So, you know, we just dropped it. And we tried to do a few little things here and there. And, and I tried to do it. And we just thought, well, you know, I remember Vicki saying she was rocking Samuel one day. And, just tears came to her eyes that she wasn't able to witness to cross the street. And, and yet, as the Lord had it the next year, both of them came to faith, you know, and we had a hand in it. And as they began to tell us, it says, 
we sure appreciate your witness for Christ. I said, what do we do? You know? It was just, a, just the way you treated each other. I mean, we weren't perfect, but we just cared for each other and the things that we did together and what we did and this, that, and the other. It becomes a, weak, a witness, and that's what exactly. Christ and his church is displayed in the church as well as the family. And being a godly family, taking stands and being what you know what's right and act and how you treat one another has a tremendous difference, and it's becoming more and more in our society. So may I encourage you that you are a witness for Christ. Any questions on Ephesians 5? We'll get back to the summary in just a minute, but let's turn over now to Colossians chapter 3. Here we see one little word, uh, one little verse here. Paul expands everything in Ephesians 5, but in Colossians 3, he only has one verse for the man and one verse for the woman, one verse for the child, or two verses, I guess. It says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. I meet a lot of men in my counseling over the years, and that is a problem with you guys and me can be. I, I, I can see it. Wife does something, you get so angry and you're so mad, he says, man, that's it. And you're just embittered. You know, you're just mm, embittered against them. And being the head of the home, you can really make it miserable for the whole family. And God says you're not to be embittered against your wife. And if you're embittered with your wife at this moment, it's unbiblical. You need to go to the Lord. You say, but she's so deserving of it. Well, I don't care. I mean, how much do you deserve and what you have done? Again, it's the unconditional aspect. Yeah, but she's doing this. You know, God doesn't, when you stand before him, he's, I mean, can you imagine him saying, well, Lord, I was embittered in him because she was deserving of it. She did this to me and this to me and this to me, and she deserved it. Now, how far is that going to get before the Lord? It may be true. But you see, it doesn't hold water with the Lord. I mean, I can sympathize with people, but then I have to bring them back to the text and say, it ain't making any difference. What your wife did, what are you to do? Are you not the leader of the home? Are you not one to be moving out? Do not be embittered in her. Don't make her embittered the way you act against her. So we need to check our hearts, guys about it involved about being embittered against our wives. So uh, that's a, just a little bitty t uh, verse there, but it's a very important text. Now turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse th uh, 7, 1 Peter 3, 7. says, you husbands, likewise, live with your wife in an understanding way. Now, you remember me saying early in our, in our message this morning, one of the things that my guys like to say is, man, I, women, you know, I can't understand them. Can't live with them, can't live without them. You know, you have those kind of statements. And I stop men like that and I say, wait a minute, that's exactly what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to live with your wife and understand. I don't understand her. I mean, why does she do this? It doesn't make sense. And what you need, to, I have, you have to stop saying, but I have to try to understand her. Ladies, don't you want to be understood? I mean, it doesn't mean that she has to do what you say, but isn't it comforting to know that you know, your husband is trying to understand you? The fault is your logic. You see, what we try to do, men, is that we try to squeeze our wives into how men think. He says, you don't make sense. You need to be thinking this way. Why? That's how I like. That's how I think. Now, if there's a fallacy in how she's thinking, point out the fallacy according to Scripture. But don't tell her, oh, that's not how you should think. I mean, it, she's a woman. Don't try to, you know, I'm a man. I don't want to try to make her think like I'm thinking unless her thinking is not according to Scripture. Then you don't have to say, don't have to think like I do. Think what the Scripture thinks. You know, that's, that's leading out. 
But just because she's, you know, it's like when <laughs> my wife likes to go to football games only because she enjoys people. Uh, you know my wife. She loves people. And so when she goes to the game, did you see that person down there? See what she got on? Isn't that neat? Do you know that person down there? And I'm going, they don't bother, you know, the game, you know, you know, we just, you know, I'm there, well, don't you want to go and talk to so-and-so? I said, I'm here to watch the football game, you know, if I go down and sit down by Jim Higgins and watch the football game, we're not going to be talking a whole lot except what's happening on the field, because, you know, don't bother me about that, you know, I'm interested in the game, you know, my wife, you know, did you see that down there, isn't that pretty? Then she, oh, what happened there, you know, <laughs> if anything interesting happened. And he used to frustrate me to death. Then now I got to say, well, that's just how, that's the way she is. And now I'm tickled at her. I just get so tickled at her. I just laugh at her. I said, you're, you're just having fun, aren't you? Why? I've come to try to understand how she thinks. How she does. She'll now sit down and watch a game with me. She has no idea what's going on, but she just wants to be with me, you know? She can only stand about a quarter, but, uh, <laughs> but then she'll get up and do something else. But we, we've learned to understand each other. That could be a great sense of, uh, uh, of struggle in our home. But men, we are to try to understand her. Not try, we are to get involved in understanding our wives. Peter says it, likewise live with your wife in an understanding way. Why? You can become a dictator and not even know it. You can become a militant person. Because I do it the way I do it. Do it the way I want to do it. And have no sensitivity of what your wife's thinking is and how she does it and how she wants to do it. I mean, that's not right. I'm not saying she's always right in the way she does, but we need to be sensitive to what she says. Notice it says what Peter says. Your, you, husband, likewise, live with your wives in an understanding way as the weaker vessel, since she's a woman. Now, the feminist and the feminazis would just go crazy with this one, <laughs> okay? But what, what's wrong with saying, because she's a woman? It's not an inferior situation, because she's a woman, because she's feminine and not masculine. That's what he's saying. He's not trying to say, because she's a woman. It's because she's different. She's a woman. Uh, for example, now this is not always true. I, what do you mean by she's different? Uh, um, I'm still learning on this, ladies, so don't don't think I haven't learned. But what do you mean by the weaker vessel? Well, let's just look at the differences, and then we maybe look at something, the weakness. It has nothing to do with spirituality. It has nothing to do with inheritance before the Lord. It has nothing to do with the promises. You're equal in all the spiritual aspects, okay? More of the physical what we're looking at when we're talking about the weaker vessel. But look at some of the differences that we may have. What does a woman look at? I want to tell you, I'm a classic male that, that uh, you could point to. If, if my home, I mean, you look at my home and you come inside of it, and I want to tell you right up front, every bit of it that's beautiful is my wife. You know, not me. The flowers out front, I'm beginning to appreciate those little bitty flowers look so pretty. And all the you know, this, that, and the other. But if you would have saw, if you would have seen my room in Pally, I didn't have a picture on the wall. I mean, I didn't want to mess with it. I had time to study, man. I was, how's it? Uh, they're involved with the aesthetics of things, aren't they? Uh, not so much the purpose. <laughs> Sometimes, but they're more how it looks. I'm looking at what is the function of it, you know, the purpose of it. Does it fit, you know? They're looking for, well, it doesn't look nice. Yeah, but it works, you know? <laughs> so, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, ladies are more relational and family-oriented and children-oriented, where husbands are more job-oriented, influence-oriented, business-oriented, sports-oriented, hobby-oriented, right? I mean... If, to be honest, I could walk in a room with a group of people, and because I didn't know them, I could be just as comfortable, just, hi, how you doing? You know, my wife just going, what's wrong with you? You know, let's go meet so-and-so, you know? I'm going, okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't know her. Well, I don't either. Let's go, you know? She's just relational, okay? Uh, ladies are more um, emotional and sensitive. Men are more factual and tough, macho. What do you want to call it? 
identity. There's a difference, isn't there? Men, what we have a tendency to do is try to mold our wives into being men. And you really don't want that, but that's just because we're men. That's how we think, that's how we move, and that's how we breathe, and that's what we are. We need to be sensitive to that. When it talks about weaker vessels, I think he's dealing with the physical. I mean, you know, I mean, we do have more muscles as a general rule, okay? We, we can stand more physical labor, you know. Sometimes not mental. <laughs> they can outlast you. There's a hormonal difference, you know? Uh, the hormonal cycle of the month and menopause and the whole thing, there's a difference there in makeup. That's what God made it. We could go on to other things. But anyway, God says that we are to live with them in an understanding way. They're different than we are. Thank God they're different. You know? But there's a difference. She's a woman, but notice that she, he came back to make sure there's nothing taken out of this as inferior. And grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Man came in to me. They want to be counseled. He says, my Christian life's really off the wall. You know, it seems like it's just dull. Something's happening. I said, oh, I see. And I asked him about studying the Word and prayer. And he said, yeah, I'm doing all that. And says, well, how's your relationship with your wife? Does that have anything to do with it? I said, wait a minute. What do you mean it doesn't have anything to do with it? Peter says, if we're not living with our wife in an understanding way, don't think your prayers are going to be answered. It's going to be a hindrance in your spiritual life. Men, there's a, there's a tendency with us, because we have to work with it at work, I think. We have to deal with people and work with men at work that we don't like, who don't like us, or, you know, they are, they're just, somehow there's just, uh, they're not nice people or whatever, or they're trying to, to uh, uh, stab you in the back or whatever, and you got to work with them. And so you just learn how to handle that. And you just have to handle it, right, guys? Well, what happens is you bring that home, and there's a, there's a spat at home and everything, and you just go on like nothing happened. And you learn how to handle it, just the way it is. And the wife's going crazy. And I want to tell you, spiritually, it doesn't work. You can't do that at home with your wife. You can't have a spat and everything and just say, well, that's the way it is because it's going to affect your relationship with the Lord. Your prayers are going to hit the ceiling. God's going to say, get it right first. And so it has everything to do with your spiritual life. Do not think that because you're doing fine at work and people don't see you at home, I mean at work, how you do at home, and your home's not right, and you're not in correct relationship with your wife, that everything's going to be okay in your spiritual life. It will not be okay in your spiritual life. You may fake it with people at work, fake it with people at church, but ultimately there'll be a blowout. And it's really not a blowout, it's a slow leak. Okay? So we men need to take heed to that. Now let's summarize what we learned about the husband's role. And I put it in your notes there. He is to be the leader. He is to be the head. It's a loving leadership. It's a servant type of leadership. It's not a dictatorial leadership. It's not a a uh, D.I. sergeant type of leadership or military leadership. He is to be a lover. He is to be responsible for, pure, uh, uh, responsible for the purity and growth of his wife. He takes care of her, provides and protects her. It should be a permanent relationship and a permanent witness for Christ. Don't be embittered against her. You are to live with her in an understanding way. That would be the role of the husband toward the mate. I know I had to go through that quite quickly, but we've had two times on it. And I hope, men, it's so easy at this point to say, forget it, <laughs> I can't do that. Instead of saying, Lord, I can see that I've grown or that I need to improve. It, the worst thing that could happen today is that you hear what I say today and just forget it. Say, you know, I know that. And you don't take it before the Lord and be a better husband. That's what I'll be praying. Praying my own life myself. Now in Ephesians 6 verse 4 we come to the parent-children, parent-child situation. So let's get back there in Ephesians. In 6 verse 4 it says, And fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now I always wonder, so why did he say fathers? Why didn't he say parents? Well he said fathers because who's the head of the home? The man is. Dad is, okay? Does that mean dad's the only one that disciplines? 
Only ones in the trucks? Absolutely not. But who's the final responsibility that's going to be before the Lord? You are, man. God's going to count, call you into accountability. Mothers may do a lot more teaching hour by hour with the children, but you are responsible for them. So I think that's why he said fathers. So mothers, too, are responsible under the headship of the, of the husband. Don't provoke your children to anger. Now, how do you do that? I'm going to tell you how you can provoke your children to anger so you won't do it, okay? And this is not all of them. I just put it, I, I quickly wrote these 10 points. <laughs> First, discipline the children when they don't know the rules. Man, uh, you will send a, uh, uh, a child ballistic on that. Uh, number two, when the punishment is disproportionate to the act committed. The punishment is not fair, in other words. Number three, you discipline out of anger will provoke your children. Disciplining your child for things which you consistently do yourself. <laughs> don't do that. Well, Dom, you always do it. Well, I don't, you know, don't do it. Well, they get embittered at that. They get angry because, well, why are you telling me to do it when you don't do it? Uh, discipline inconsistently or not at all will, will provoke your children to anger. Because what happens, they get so bad, then you come down so heavy on them they don't you know they just become just angered at that six push your children to excel without the same amount of effort of encouragement or shall we say pushing them consistently beyond their ability or you can have constant criticism they're never good enough constant criticism I mean you, you're going to criticize your children a lot but do, do you have the same amount of encouragement on the side of criticism are you pushing them beyond their ability I mean I want to push my child to his ability but not beyond it number seven trying to live your life through your child I didn't get this I mean, ladies, one of the number one thing you'll need to watch is when your child, if you have a, uh, uh, a daughter, is to, when they get married, that you begin to think about all the things you want in that, in that wedding because you didn't get it, or you had it and they want it, and it'll have all kinds of problems. That's just one characteristic. I want them to go to ballet because I didn't get to go to ballet. I want them to do this because I didn't do it. And, and they begin to push them into things that you want them to do because you didn't do it, or you always wanted to do it, and you didn't do it. And men, you know, I want to be the best baseball player, and you begin to push your kids into sports and this, that, and the other, and you begin to push and push and push, and you start trying to live your life through your child. You can provoke them to anger. Absent father or mother, therefore constantly saying you don't have enough time. You don't have enough time. You don't have enough time. Lack of participation in, 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 uh, in their interest, in their uh, sports, pleasure, and life. I don't have time to do that. I'm not interested in what they're interested in. I don't want to go to their games. I don't talk about what they want to talk about. I'm not interested in it. That will provoke your child to anger. And then tenth, and of course not last, manipulation. Manipulating your child to do what you want them to do by all kinds of anger, or emotion, pride, or whatever, uh, uh, flattery. There's all kinds of ways of doing it, but getting what you want. They will only figure that out and will provoke them to anger. Sure. Disciplining your child when he does not know the rules, when the punishment is disproportionate to the acts committed, the punishment is not fair, in other words, Discipline out of anger. Discipline your child for things which you consistently do yourself. Discipline inconsistently or not at all in a certain area. Pushing your child to excel without the same amount of effort of encouragement or pushing them consistently beyond their ability or just being a critical criticism all the time. 
trying to live your life through your child? Absent father and mother, therefore you're constantly saying, I don't have time, I don't have time. Lack of participation in their interests, sports, pleasure, or their own life. And manipulation. Now, there are principles I've put in your notes, like the principles for a proverb for the husband and fathers. You can have some fun looking those up. And uh, fathers, I really highly recommend that you do. That's not all the things in Proverbs, but that'll get you started. Let's look at the Ten Commandments of a Successful Father. I found these and modified them according to what I like. And so let me read the Ten Commandments to the Father, okay? First deals with family priority. Thou shalt hold no other group among more important than the family unit. In all thy ways be faithful to it. Number two, dealing with teaching. Thou shalt teach thy sons and daughters to love, respect, and obey God and their parents. Number three, loving. Thou shalt be a love, loving and considerate father and husband. Number four, honorable speech. Thou shalt not speak in a manner unbecoming to a Christian gentleman. Number five, corporate worship. Thou shalt by example make Sunday a special day set aside for God and for the worship of the family. And number six, physical and spiritual provider. Thou shalt provide for thy uh, family um, spiritually, physically, in an adequate manner. Number seven, dealing with home discipline. Thou shalt promote and lead family worship in thy home. Number eight, dealing with honesty. Thou shalt be honest in all thy dealings. Number nine, respect other family members. Thou shalt respect the desires and freedoms of thy family as individuals. And number ten, loving leader, thou And we <clears throat> began the role of the husband, and we saw that uh, the husband should regard his family as a blessing. He should gain joy from his family. I think men often look many places to find joy and happiness, but we're forced to find it in our homes. Now, that's not the only place, but it should be the major place that we find the joy. We looked, again, uh, second of all, to the husband or